it's good to be the boss. You get a parking space, people bring you coffee, and everyone has to laugh at your opening gag at the AGM. Or else it's their asses. Usually, it's also good to be the boss in video games too, where you're a towering, terrifying enemy, usually with a screen-filling health bar to match your imposing status. But we say usually because sometimes a particularly unlucky boss will suffer the indignity of getting demoted to a regular, rank-and-file enemy after you've kicked their butts. As if the game is running its own performance review and doesn't like what it sees. Here are seven bosses who ended up as regular enemies. Ouch. But we're spoilers for the following games. Samus Aran, star of the Metroid series, takes a direct approach to local wildlife she encounters on her interstellar journeys. Ugh. This planet doesn't have an RSPCA, does it? But Samus gets her comeuppance in a serious way in Metroid Prime, at a point where she's just getting done fatally blasting the protective shells off these ice-dwelling reptilian creatures. Or to give them their proper name, Baby She-Goths, which sort of implies the existence of a... Oh no. Crap! It's a grown adult boss She-Goth! Presumably a parent, judging by its angry reaction to what Samus has been up to. The She-Goth is a visually imposing creature, and seems very tough at first, with a spiny carapace that renders it totally immune to Samus's weapons, except in the moments after it's done firing its ice breath, when it sucks in a few ragged breaths and leaves its massive mouth wide open to having missiles fired into it. Maybe try breathing through your nose, She-Goth. Just an idea. But not one She-Goth is willing to entertain, seemingly. And so, after ingesting enough missiles, this once fearsome foe is defeated. And apparently, Metroid Prime wasn't too impressed with the fight it put up, because later in the game, She-Goth has clearly been demoted to a normal enemy. Ouch. Except now that Samus has even more impressive weaponry, she doesn't even have to bother IDing a weak point, and the already humbled adult She-Goth is easily smashed flat with some judicious plasma beaming. Okay, this just seems cruel at this point. At least leave a breeding pair, Samus? Give them a chance? You are this. One chance. <laughs> Anyone who has played Tomb Raider Anniversary will tell you the Centaur boss fight is absolute horse. After turning your French-accented enemy Dupont into pâté, these two equestrian enemies that look like they've crawled out of a Doom concept artist's recycle bin reveal that not only can they throw fireballs at you, but they have the power to turn you into stone and, shortly after, rubble. Now, these two did feature in the original Tomb Raider, but for the anniversary remake they were made a lot trickier, forcing you to deploy the new mechanics added in this souped-up version. For instance, Anniversary added the Adrenaline Dodge Headshot, whereby Lara had to shoot an enemy to enrage it, have them charge at her, and then dodge at the last minute like an absolute badass. Aw, oh, cool! But this wasn't enough to finish off these centaurs. While a headshot kills most other things their size, this move merely incapacitates these skeletal-headed foes for a brief moment. At this point, Lara has to use her brand new grapple to hook onto and pull away their shields, Also, she can use the shiny surfaces to reflect their stony eye beams, then shatter them instead. Whew, I'm tired just thinking about it. This fight is a multi-step mix of acrobatics and tactics, and you'll be extremely relieved when it's finally over. So imagine our yelp of fear when much later, in the final level of the game, a centaur runs right at you down a tight corridor and... 
Oh, I was expecting, well, more than that. It seems that after being hoisted by their own petard, this poor centaur got a humiliating downgrade. No shield, no stone beams, no friend, just turned into a glorified jump scare that you can kill by unloading tons of panicked bullets into it or one single adrenaline dodge headshot. I guess it's harder to fight Lara when you're the centaur of attention. Boo! What? It's an oldie but a goodie. Disagree. There aren't many things in Bloodborne that you want to see more than once, except maybe the end credits. Pretty far down the list of things that are enjoyable to behold is the Blood-Starved Beast, a thrashing, howling quadruped creature found in the depths of the game's old Yarnum, whose most distinctive characteristic is having had all the skin on its back flayed off. Which to be fair, explains why it's blood-starved, because that sounds like a good way to lose all your blood. The Beast is one of the more imposing boss fights in the early stages of Bloodborne, and that's saying something. Able to gut you in just a few frames of animation, and emitting a poison so powerful that you might still lose this boss fight even after you've won it. Deep breath. Why did I just die? After beating it, you might fairly assume that you've seen the last of the hideous blood-starved beast, but that's wishful thinking, because this boss has merely retreated much further into the game to lick its wounds which to be fair, can't be a quick process. That explains how long you have to wait to encounter the BSB again, specifically until the Old Hunters DLC, which features among its many charming locales, this dark, miserable cave at the foot of a river of gore. Lurking at the back of this cave is your old pal, but this time sadly reduced in stature, having lost its famous screen-filling health bar, now in possession of a bog-standard regular old HP ticker floating above its head. Oh dear. The beast is still a worthy foe, but with you being so much stronger at this point, no second and third phases of attacks, and frankly, no massive orchestral score banging away in the background, don't expect the beast to give you quite as much trouble this time around. Farewell, blood-starved beast. We'll think of you whenever we hear a mournful howling. Or peel a banana. Oh, what was up with that big guy? He's been infected for a long time. We call him bloaters. Bloater. Okay, got it. I hate to interrupt your little biology lesson, but can we get the f*** out of here, please? The infected in The Last of Us come in a lot of terrifying varieties, but only one is hulking and horrible enough to get its own arena-style boss fight. This happens when you reach Bill's town. After a gauntlet of runners, stalkers and clickers through the halls of the school, you're about ready to lie down for a big nap once you bust your way into the school gymnasium. But even before the cutscene finishes, you quickly notice the wide open space with the chest-high boxes and, oop, there's probably gonna be a big fight in here, isn't there? This may go to hold it for a long that don't sound good. Oh no. Called it. This fight is, to put it in a single word, stressful. Not only is the humongous bloater lobbing spore-filled mycotoxin bombs your way, but other infected are dribbling in from unblockable entry points, forcing you to stop and deal with them while the bloater somehow, despite its massive size, manages to sneak up on you. Ah! <laughs> Only when you panic and throw a Molotov cocktail at it, because nothing else seems to work, do you discover that the fire burns away the thick armor-like fungal growths that cover this giant, injuring it and allowing the shots fired by yourself and Bill to finally do some real damage. Whew, that fight was a lot, and bloaters are also way easier from now on. After being forced to battle with one, the majority of other encounters suddenly become optional. Instead of making you scramble for your life as a bloater bears down on you, the game offers the option of sneaking around, which, while slower, is a lot less panic-inducing and definitely saves on ammunition. Plus, it's extremely funny to get past one and then see it easily defeated by a single door. Not so scary now, are you? That, that, that door is jammed shut, right? Oh, good. Heck, even when another one turns up towards the end of a fight in the lakeside resort, Ellie seems more annoyed than scared. It's a bloater! What? 
no special cutscene to announce it, it feels less like a nightmare encounter and more like a minor inconvenience. And you can quickly get Ellie to take it down from higher ground with some well-placed molotovs and a deep sigh. Finally. Safe to say, not quite the same gravitas as the first one. You should be taking notes, bloater. Oh, your brain has been eaten away by the cordyceps fungus so you can't make notes. I see. If you've played a lot of games, you'll be familiar with that sense when you walk into a large empty room and you just have a feeling of what's going to happen. Yeah, something, something like that. This also classic boss fight setup is the start of your confrontation with the nightmarish tripod, a hideous necromorph formed of several human corpses mashed together with two powerful clawed arms that it uses both to spring towards you and swipe at you. Investing this boss requires hammering away at three yellow pustules on its body. Two are found on the elbows and the third, uh, hmm, I don't see it actually. Ah! Large bladed tongue. Now we know. The tripod is such a large ferocious creature that you might assume the fight you had with it and your conquest over it were special. But that's where Dead Space 2 pulls the rug from under you, because later in the game tripods become common as muck. Like later on when hero Isaac is riding an elevator and they literally start pouring in through the walls. Subsequent encounters are still exciting, but it's hard not to feel that the tripod is somewhat hard done by when it gets relegated in this way. Also, becoming a normal enemy means you'll have to fight lots more tripods and spend more minutes of your life considering the phrase bladed tongue, which I, personally, could do without. Mm. Demon isn't the biggest boss you'll fight in Dark Souls, but for many, it's the biggest pain in the arse. Trapped in a tiny sunless garden in the lower undead burg, there's no room to swing a cat in this boss room, let alone kill the Capra Demon and his two undead dogs. Many players will get caught on the scenery or stuck in a corner, while this dual-wielding douchebag and or his hounds turn you into Dark Souls dust over and over again. I'm surrounded. I'm completely and utterly surrounded. There's, right. like, basically... Yep, I see it. I see it. I see it. I see it. I know. It takes real patience and tactics to deal with multiple enemies in a tight space like this, so finally defeating him feels amazing. A real triumph. Well, like this. Oh, plunging attack! Oh my god! Oh my god! Yes! Yay! <laughs> so imagine how players feel when they get to the demon ruins and there's like 50 of the bastards. Way later in the game, when you've beefed yourself up, gangs of them can be found hanging around these lava lakes. God, there's just... Oh my... Oh my goodness! And oh boy, while there may be tons of them, they're tons easier to deal with. That was nice, two nice, light nice, hits, nice, nice. two light attacks. Good. Not only are you a higher level, but there's more space to maneuver, no fast angry dogs, and these guys are weaker than the Capra Demon you fought back in the Berg. So while they might cause initial panic, players quickly realize that these are now just another thing to deal with, peppered across these lava filled rooms not to stop you, but just to slow you down. In some ways, it's sad to see a great boss be reduced to something so easily defeated, but in another way, it's actually pretty great and cathartic. Where are your hounds now, eh? <laughs> I think I've played enough Dark Souls for today.
Spider-Man and Venom Maximum Carnage for the Super NES is a veritable who's who of Spider-Man villains. Why, just in the intro you've got Carnage, Shriek, and even Doppelganger, the evil copy of Spider-Man who is almost totally mindless but does in fairness have eight limbs, and so is the more accurate of the Spider-Men. So which iconic ne'er-do-well do you think, in this character-packed side-scrolling brawler, have the makers of the game chosen to be the first boss Spidey faces down? Rhino? Shocker? Mysterio? Sandman? Lizard? Hammerhead? No, it's... Lizzie and Dana. Doesn't ring a bell. Is this Earth 616 continuity? Uh, or... What it is, is a pair of, I guess, fitness enthusiasts in sportswear and high-top sneakers who rock up for a stage one boss fight to kill Spider-Man with acrobatic moves and enthusiastic hair whipping. Understandably, Spider-Man proceeds to shatter their bones with his prodigious superhuman strength. But bizarrely, this isn't the last you see of Lizzie and Dana, because beyond this point, the pair will occasionally drop in among the hordes of other regular enemies. Presumably, this is because, having shot their shot at entering the pantheon of iconic Spidey villains, Lizzie and Dana are now demoted, which would explain why the game sees them getting beat up amid the standard array of street toughs. And also, why we haven't heard of them since. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's Disney Plus. Lizzie and Dana nine-part Disney Plus event coming 2025. Seriously? So those were the bosses that we absolutely trounced, and so the game went regular enemies. No, no, no bonuses for you, but bonuses for us and leveling up and smooshing bosses. Whoa. Can you think of any? Let us know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, do the regular thing of commenting, liking, subscribing. And also, if you want to go that step further, we have the OX Supporters Club. There will be a link on screen here. And hey, we've got way more videos for you to watch over here. Please go and enjoy them. Uh, you will, you know, feel go, go on like a good binge of those because there's loads of them. We've been doing this for a very long time and uh, we appreciate all of your lovely views. We'll see you next time. Bye.